Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner, and I'm an Associate Professor of Pathology and Dermatology at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences in Little Rock. And I am here today with one of my own personal heroes and someone who needs no introduction, Dr. Philip McKee, who spent his career in dermatopathology at the Dermatology Institute of London, Brigham and Women's Hospital, among other places, and is also, of course, the author of McKee's Pathology of the Skin, which is now in its fifth edition, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. And you've passed that on, right? You've passed the torch of your book on to some of your some of your followers who are now taking it and running with it, right? Yes. Uh, I, after the first edition, it got progressively more and more difficult. And so by the third edition, I took uh, Eduardo Colangi, who, who works in London, who is a great friend of mine, he came on board to help. And with the fourth edition, we then had uh, Eduardo Colangi, Thomas Brenn, and Alex Lazar, and myself. And um, by the end of that, I wanted nothing more to do with the book. I'd had enough. And I said to Eduardo, I'm afraid you're going to have to look after it. So he said, OK. And he replaced me with Steve Billings, because we needed to have people from the US as well as from Europe. So Eduardo looked after the fifth edition. And wow, he did a he did a fantastic name. I totally agree. It's it's. I have it on my desk, and I'm still um, I, hopefully soon going to do a video review of it, actually, um, uh, for online. And it's it's just a beautiful book with with gorgeous photographs. And and uh, like I tell my trainees, it's the, still the book that I refer to on a regular basis in my practice. It really is like it's like the Bible of Derm Path, and in a way, it's just got everything in it, and the, it's got clinical photos as well as um, Derm Path photos. I cannot imagine the undertaking of writing. A book like that, especially you know, it's this big now because it's so much more knowledge that we have in Derm Path uh, over the years. But I just wrote a very small book, and it was it was about enough to make me retire. So I don't know how you possibly did this. Well, I was going to say to you, you've actually started down that road. <laughs> this is how it starts off. Because now that you've written one book, uh, with the passage of time, your you will end up wanting to write more and more and more. And so sooner or later, there will be the Gardner textbook. Oh, I don't know about that. Skin. I think and that would do me in. That will be in competition, <laughs> which will not do. That sounds good. Let's, let's avoid it. I'll, I'll keep it thin in one, vol one edition only, I think. Well, I wanted three, uh, three volumes. And I, I worked hard with Elsevier to let me have three volumes. And they said, don't, don't be ridiculous. Has there, are there any books with three volumes? I don't think I've seen one. There used to be, in, way back in the old days. In the days, days of yore? The, the Rook book was four, oh. was four volumes wow. at one time. And I, it's my egomania. I thought three volumes would be just so cool on a bookshelf. But they said, no. You're having two volumes maximum, so that's that. Uh, you obviously collected an enormous number of cases and photographs of your career, um, but I, I seem to remember you telling me that some of them got lost through hard drive failure or something of that sort, and, and it was a real lesson to me of, if I lost my pictures, that's like everything. I, what advice do you have for, for taking and organizing photographs for people who want to use them for teaching? Well, I'll tell you what, I, I, I'm very obsessional. In fact, I'm, and I've got worse and worse. So now when I take photographs, uh, I save them on my computer. I save them on an external hard drive. I save them in Dropbox. I mm -hmm. save them in Google Drive. All the places. <laughs> I, I have them in five different places. And that way, I will never, well, unless, you know, the world ends and we no longer have electricity. Yeah, then it's all, it doesn't matter yeah, anyway, right? I mean, well, the trouble is, you see, in the old days, you had hard copy. And that's all gone. And I scanned, this is, this is where the trouble went. I scanned thousands of transparencies uh, onto my computer. But when I lost that external, when that external hard drive broke, which was when we first moved to France, that was six years ago, I lost all of those. Oh. And they were beautiful oh. pictures. They were all 35 millimeter shots, and they were gorgeous. And they're, they're lost irretrievably. But that's life. You have to put up with that. It is. But it's a good lesson, I think, to all of us to remember that, you know, that 
keeping data safe, especially priceless, irreplaceable data. For me, my I can buy a new computer or new things, but the teaching material I've collected, that's that's everything I use to teach yeah. my residents and fellows and students. And, and so I want to make sure I keep that safe. Um, All right. I think you can't save material in too many places. That's a good point. The more places you save it in, and also it's fantastic because when you, you know, I find that the modern technology amazing. I, I'm sitting here and I can access one of my drives on my phone mm -hmm. and pull up pictures and lectures and I think, wow, it's amazing, this is right? so cool. And you use uh, you use the whole slide images, digital slides from online sites, and yes. you make your own pictures from those now from people I who do. post in your group, yes. right? It, it's oh, it's it's just fantastic. It's fantastic. So I know we've talked before about the Facebook group and and that you started, and and it's really what's thirteen thousand members now, or yeah, nearly fourteen. Amazing, right. and and so I I actually in pre preparation for this interview, I asked some of the members of your group. You know, what would you like me to ask, Dr. McKee? And one, and there were a lot of really great questions that came up. And one really wonderful one, I think, was was someone who said, you know, it's hard to imagine someone who's an expert like Dr. McKee struggling as a resident or as a fellow, as a trainee. And you know, did you ever struggle in training? And of course, the answer must be yes. But but I think sometimes hearing stories of of how experts struggle helps uh, the rest of us common folk feel a little bit more normal. So tell us about some struggles you experienced during your training or career. Well, I, I think that it's a, something that people nowadays will not experience because uh, people are more sensitive to, to delicate souls. But when I was training, we, we used to have a, a session every Friday and it was called the Red Box. The Red Box. The Red Box, which is a bad start. The Red <laughs> Box is not good news. And in the Red Box, we'd have 12 cases. And all of the junior staff, all the, what you would refer to as residents and fellows, there'd be about 20 of us. And we'd meet up on Friday afternoon, having spent Thursday and Friday morning looking at these 12 cases. And... Uh, the, the, the meeting in Friday afternoon, everybody seemed to come. It was a huge, the entire staff. So you'd have all the medical staff, the technical staff. In those days, we had our own cleaners and all sorts, and they would all come, and the porters would come. So it was a, a big session. And then each each case, somebody would be selected who would have to stand up at the front and give a description of what he was looking or she was looking at and then make a diagnosis. And these were very difficult cases. And so you could be destroyed completely, <laughs> regularly. You would stand up and you'd get the diagnosis wrong and then you start stammering. And the professor of pathology at that time was, he was not, he didn't suffer fools gladly. He was a rather aggressive man. And when you got things wrong, he, he let you know in no uncertain time, terms that you were an idiot. <laughs> and this would be in front of everybody, so you'd crawl off and lick your wounds for days on end. Now, do you think this is an effective teaching technique? Yes, it actually is, because, <laughs> okay. because one never... I'll have to be harder on my residents then. One never, ever, ever made the same mistake twice. That's a good point. Uh, that's a good point. Um, you are, um, like you said, very obsessive about image quality. And I know when people post photos in um, a key term Facebook group, you often bring up the point that they need to keep the quality really high because that's how we can actually interpret them. And you'll even go so far as to take the images, Photoshop them yourself and upload them, oftentimes making a dramatic improvement. How, how did you learn Photoshop and, and what advice do you have about Photoshop? Because I, I actually found it quite challenging to learn. I can do it now, but it was not intuitive to me. So what advice do you have about well, photo editing? Well, I, I think um, there are a lot of platforms that you can use for, for manipulating images. Mm -hmm. But um, most of the ones that are free or, or, or less expensive are really directed towards people photographing scenes and mm -hmm. people and flowers and things. Not microscopic images. Exactly. Right. Now, Photoshop, when it came out, was the only tool available. And I don't know whether it was deliberate or by accident, but it turned out that Photoshop was a perfect uh, a tool to use for manipulating images of, in histopathology. It's perfect. And actually, it's, 
once you get the knack of it, it, it becomes reflex. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when I'm looking at an image, I don't have to think about what I'm doing because I follow, I follow a set pattern. Yeah. Because I know that I, because you learn from trial and error what's going to make something good and what's going to make something bad, and people basically all make the fund, they all make the same fundamental mistakes. Some of which are you can't do anything with. If they don't focus it properly, then it's no good. If they have the light completely off center, you well, you actually you can fix that, but it's but it's bit, harder, yeah. It's much harder. You can actually make it perfect, but it takes a lot of effort to do that. If people leave dirt on the slide, you can get rid of that quite easily. It's like the, the stamp tool, right? The clone stamp uh -huh. tool gets you can you can have great fun getting rid of dirt, and it really makes it quite pretty. But other than that, then you just got to play with with the white background, with colors, with um, contrast, shadows and highlights. But it's something, you, the, the best thing to do is to just have an image if you've got Photoshop. And the disadvantage is that it's expensive and you can't buy it anymore. You 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 rent it. Subscribe, you right. You yeah. subscribe. In the old days, you paid $50, you got a CD and you load it in your computer and that was that. Now. It's all done on the cloud, but uh, so anyway, let's assume that you 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 subscribe to Photoshop, then just spend an afternoon with two or three images playing with them, and it, it, you'll find out yourself what you need to do. And once you've done it, it becomes it becomes second nature. Yeah, it takes me oh no less than no more than a minute on an image to, and it's either I know it's going to be worth putting on or I trash it and <laughs> go on to the next one. No good, right. You um, you mentioned that when you were in London, uh, you worked with uh, Dr. Christopher Fletcher, right, and that, that he was actually maybe in training there, is that what you said? Yes. And so tell me about meeting Chris Fletcher and and um, interacting with him in your career. Well, uh, Chris Chris was a, was a medical student when I first met him in pathology. He, he was a medical student. When he qualified, he came in and uh, did his training in pathology, and he and I, uh, we bonded quite quickly, even though he was a junior and I was a senior member of staff. We had a tremendous overlap in personality, aggressive, uh, politically very incorrect. We both smoked like troopers, and we both liked skin pathology and soft tissue tumor pathology. So. Once he'd done his basic training, he then became my fellow and spent a year with me in dermatopathology before he then went on to a soft tissue tumor pathology fellowship. And we sort of, we sort of, uh, we combined our roles. And so he stayed with me doing skin and I, I sort of stayed with him learning soft tissue tumor pathology. Oh, that's good. And then, um, one day, this is classic Chris Fletcher, one day he, he said to me, Philip, I need to speak to you. And I said, sure, what is it, Chris? He said, you know, you're not very good at soft tissue tumors. I think you should stick with the skin and I'll do the soft tissue tumors. <laughs> so I said, that is fantastic. I hate soft tissue tumors <laughs> anyway. I can't do them. So that's how... That's how things began. That worked out pretty well in the end. He's gone on to just completely revolutionize the field of, of soft tissue pathology. I mean, I use his papers multiple times per week in, in yeah. my cases that He's I diagnose. Quite an so extraordinary character. Really amazing quite for sure. Um, when you, after you retired, you moved to France, and now you live in uh, Boussai, France, is that correct? Boussai. Boussai. Yeah. And what do you do in your retirement? Someone on the group asked, you know, is this what retirement looks like? I think Kim Hyatt asked that, actually. Is this what your retirement looks like? So what, is, what does retirement look like for you and Gracie? What do you guys do? Um, well, it's not retirement, you see, really. Uh, at least it hasn't been... <sighs> It was for a while. I, I I was looking around trying to find things that would interest me, and I think I spent too long in 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 dermatopathology, and nothing else was really <laughs> making giving me a buzz, and so I 
got back into dermatopathology. Now Gracie, she she just went straight from cytopathology in Mass General, Massachusetts General Hospital, and then she becomes a an artist and. Her paintings are absolutely wonderful. She's fantastic. Lovely. Yeah. She's, she's fantastic. Now, does she ever get you to try your hand at painting? Or? No. I'd love no. to see an original Philip McKee painting, too. I, I told her I really want to get like a signed Gracie McKee you know, for my for my office, but I'd love to have a Philip McKee painting you know, next to it. It could be a stick figure, even. That's fine. Well, no, I, I, um, no, I haven't tried my hand. At, I have a little secret idea that I'm not going to tell you about, but good, I do. And if I succeed with this, it... I'll then give it to you as a present. That sounds delightful. But it might be this year, next year, okay. sometime never. Okay. Well, I'll 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 hope for sooner rather than later. Yeah. Um, what advice do you have uh, for junior trainees who want to have a career in dermatopathology? What would you tell your your younger self embarking on a career? What would you do differently, or what would you do the same? Well, that, that that's a tough one. Um, you said just, you like tough questions, though. Yeah, I, I, well, you see, it, it, it depends on the person. It depends, what you, it depends what you want in life. If you want to be really successful, uh, and if you make it to the top, although I don't like to think of it that way, but that's a good analogy, then you've got to give all of yourself. A hundred, hundred and ten percent of you has to be given into pathology, dermatopathology, medicine, and then you take out, you take out in kind, and that's how it works. So if you really, if you want to be professor of dermatopathology at NYU or something, you've really got to work very hard. Uh, and that's, that's, that's how I view it. Uh, uh, um, it's, it. It's a total commitment. Now that doesn't mean you don't have family. And, and, and children, of course you do, but nevertheless, you've got to dedicate yourself sure. to the subject. And the rewards are, are, are immense, so you get back so much. And in the end, I mean, the better we are at this, the better we can take care of our patients, and, Absolutely. and that's what, it, what it's all about, really. Um, it has been really great talking to you again and hearing about your life and your stories and uh, the advice that you have for us. And I just, uh, I just want to again say that I think it's so amazing that you have taken an entire career that you've devoted to taking care of patients, to teaching others, to writing a book. And then now in your retirement, you spend every day on Facebook educating pathologists from around the world, including me. I continue to get to learn from someone of your caliber and ask you questions. And it's so cool because it's not just me. Anyone from anywhere in the world can do that. And you you spend a lot of time every day doing that. And I think that you have you are a hero to, to trainees and practicing pathologists alike all over the world. And I just can't tell you how meaningful and inspiring that is to me. And I know every, uh, so many others have told me they feel the same way. So sincerely, thank you. Congratulations thank on you. winning the Founders Award. I can't think thank of anyone more deserving than you. Thank you very much, Jared. Thank been you. Lovely talking to you. Thank you.